folks, it's great to have Agha Bahari back with us. Uh, it's been too long since we've had a conversation, and I'm looking forward in particular to discussing my new book, Artemis Unveiled, uh, with somewhat of a focus on the role that Iran plays in this narrative. Um, folks, you can also check out Agha's uh, YouTube channel, which is linked in the description. It's great to be back with you, Agha. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be back, and congratulations for your new book, Artemis Unveiled. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. So um, you've now had a chance to actually read this novella twice. Yes. And, uh, and so I will just turn it over to you and let's see uh, you know, how far the rabbit hole we want to go. Yes, we always go down very interesting rabbit holes. So looking forward to that. Uh, first, I'm curious to know, how would you define the style of this uh, storytelling slash reporting? So that's a good question. I mean, I wrote... Uh, two sci-fi novels, Faustian Futurist and uh, Uberman, which have a more conventional structure with a plot and protagonists and dialogue and so on and so forth. Artemis Unveiled has kind of the length of a novella of, you know, like a short novel, longer than a short story, shorter than a novel. But it's more really a kind of utopian philosophical treatise than it is a work of fiction. It's part prediction, part, um, uh, uh, I would say, disclosure or revelation, and part uh, prescription. So what I really wanted to do in this book was to present in somewhat more tangible terms my vision of what a Promethean society might actually look like. But in order to do that, I had to set it up uh, by offering a projection of various converging catastrophes that are going to essentially wreck the modern world over the next, let's say, 30 years or so. Because otherwise, the vision that I have of this Promethean society would be utterly incredible. Uh, so, you know, there'd be no way to plausibly project how we would get from the current society that we have to something like what I envision without taking into account the radical transformation of the world that I think uh, is going to take place due to various convergent catastrophes that I uh, predict and depict in this narrative. So uh, ultimately, to answer your question, I would say more it's a kind of utopian philosophical treatise that is packaged or framed as a novella, um, and that also therefore offers a platform for making certain predictions uh, which is a bit of a dangerous game, but in any case. Yeah, right out of your book, I think this summarized what you said correctly, that a truth with the aura of something so long suppressed as a catastrophic danger to society that a putative disclosure was lent the weight of revelation. But again, as you said yourself, to speak the truth and shoot well with arrows, that is Persian virtue, which I think is completely aligned with most of what we're going to talk today, uh, which is the role of Iran and Persia and how this and your book, you know, it all also came to my mind that it's kind of a Dr. Georgiani's hero's journey, that you came from a background that is deeply rooted in Iran, even though you were not raised in Iran and you went through your journey and now you're coming back, giving back something to Iran that belongs to Iran. It just seems to be forgotten. So let's get right to that with a quote that I also mentioned uh, in our previous conversation from one of our conversation on New Human Podcast that you said, no country is more Promethean in its foundation than Iran. Yeah, well, I mean, I've argued beginning in Prometheus and Atlas, actually, beginning with my very first book, uh, where I introduced the archetype of Prometheus as sort of the... Um, the spiritual force of technological science as it unfolds throughout history and reshapes all societies on the globe. When I introduced the archetype of Prometheus in that book, uh, I began immediately to make the argument that this was a, an icon, um, a, uh, yeah, let's say an icon that uh, really only began to have significant influence over Greek culture and by extension, Western civilization due to the Persian colonization of Greece. So in Prometheus and Atlas, I show how the radical transformation of Greek society 
uh, by the Persian colonization of Ionia and through the Persian wars with Athens, and, uh, with Athens um, is what actually transformed Greek society in the period of Aeschylus to uh, appreciate the archetype of Prometheus, which is the archetype of a Titan who stands in opposition to the entire pantheon of the Greek culture. And uh, this deity, Prometheus, has in a more anthropomorphic form all of the qualities of Ahura Mazda. So, you know, for example, the word Promethea or forethought that's at the core of the name of Prometheus is identical to the idea of Sepanto Aminu or the progressive mentality, which is the defining quality of Zarathustra. Uh, and then, of course, you have the association with fire, right? I mean, Prometheus steals fire, uh, which is emblematic both of the light of science and the fire of the forge of technology and brings it as a gift for the sake of human empowerment, right? So that humans can stand on their own two feet and not be subservient to the gods. Well, the eternal ever burning fire is the principal symbol of the religion of Zarathustra. And in Zarathustra's teachings, what the fire stands for is Asha or cosmic order, what the Greeks call logos. And in fact, you can see very clearly how this idea entered you know, the Western world via Greece due to Iranian influence, particularly on Heraclitus. In the work of Heraclitus of Ephesus, Heraclitus uses fire as the uh, metaphor for cosmic order, fire ever changing its forms. This cosmos was neither by any God nor man made its fire ever changing its forms, right? And he repeatedly uses this metaphor. Well, Heraclitus of Ephesus was uh, invited by Darius the Great to come be the court philosopher of the Persian Empire. So clearly he was recognized by the Magi as someone who had an Iranian way of thinking. And it's through him that, you know, uh, fire basically makes its way from uh, the, the homeland of Zarathustra to, you know, basically the cradle of the Promethean West. And then, of course, there's the whole question of um, Prometheus being a titan, right? In the Indo-European cultures, in all of them, we have this opposition between the gods and the titans. The Olympians and the Titans, or the uh, Devas and the Ashuras in Sanskrit, or the Devs and the Ahuras in the Iranian tradition. And so Ahura Mazda literally means Titan of Wisdom or Titanic Wisdom. That is Prometheus. Okay, so, and this rubs the Parsis all the wrong way. They get agitated when he says stuff like this because, you know, they want to have this really abstract monotheistic idea of what Aura Mazda is and, and so forth. And it's true that Zarathustra's genius was taking an archaic, much more anthropomorphic archetype and turning it into something that becomes really the first abstract philosophical idea, namely Aura Mazda and the whole system that comes from out of that, right? But if you, if you do the genealogy of that, you see that really Zarathustra is working with a kind of, uh, you know, um, Indo-Aryan, you know, uh, a, an ancient Scythian proto-Persian uh, religion in the Caucasus, where you have this figure Amirani, and Amirani, you know, is is also like a fire bringer, and he's also punished by the gods by having his liver eaten out while he's chained to the Caucasus. So clearly, elements of this god who was in the back, or Titan rather, Ahura, who was in the background of Zarathustra as he developed his uh, philosophical system is also the wellspring of the myth of Prometheus as it made its way to Greece. And uh, so, so clearly, you know, the Titan of wisdom uh, that winds up being Prometheus in Greek culture is what Zarathustra develops into the philosophical idea of Ahura Mazda. And these are the kinds of reasons why I say that ultimately um, Iran, you know, is the wellspring of the Promethean mentality, but you know, more specifically, and rather more practically in more tangible terms, just look at the culture of uh, Hachamanashid Iran. The Achaemenid Empire was engaged in titanic projects of industriousness, civilization, the cultivation of the earth and of society. Things like, for example, uh, bringing water through the Qanat system, the Qanat or Qanat system, uh, bringing water from the mountains into 
extremely arid areas, in some cases deserts, so that you could build these huge gardens there called paridaesa, which is where we get the word paradise from in English, uh, and building a, an intercontinental highway system, which allowed for a uh, Pony Express postal service to function, or geoengineering on the scale of carving the Suez Canal for the first time. It was an invention of the Hachamanashids. These are all Promethean projects that show you uh, the value of technology for this culture and the belief that's at the core of Zarathustra's teaching that it is our duty to modify the world and to basically act as agents of the creator in the completion of the creation, which from a Judeo-Christian or, or Muslim perspective is satanic, but it's at the core of Zarathustra's worldview and it's, uh, it's proto-Promethean. Very interesting. Uh, basically what you describe is the origin of futurism, which goes back to Iran as Zarathustra's gospel, as a Promethean guide and gospel symbolized by the eternal fire. Exactly. So every culture before the Persians, and, and by the way, I'm not the first person to say this. Hegel, go read Hegel's philosophy of history. Hegel says the Persians began world history. There was no world history before the Persians. And he has a very, now these days, this is not a popular view of history. It's considered very colonialist, very chauvinistic, right? But Hegel has this classic view of, you know, history with going from the Greeks to the Romans to the Germans, you know, and who are the great standard bearers of the forward march of history. Hegel was the great theoretician of progress in the sense of a teleological goal-directed forward development of humanity over the course of history, right? And this same Hegel, who, who's the preeminent modern thinker of progress and of the idea of a future-oriented history in the West, this same Hegel says, listen, it didn't begin with the Greeks. It began with the Persians and with Zarathustra and then passed on to Greece and then to Rome and the Germans and so forth. And by the way, just quick side note, Nietzsche, who also talks about philosophy of the future, remember Nietzsche, the subtitle of Nietzsche's book, Beyond Good and Evil, is toward a philosophy of the future. Mm. And he, the future is very important for Nietzsche, the idea of the future and of the evolution of the Superman, uh, the gospel of which he puts in the mouth of a returned Zarathustra and thus book Zarathustra, right? Um, and Nietzsche had said, it shouldn't have been the Romans who inherited the Greek intellectual legacy. It should have gone back to the Persians and the Persians rather than the Romans should have been the ones to carry it forward. Anyway, uh, so Hegel and Zarathustra and the idea of the future. If you look in uh, the world uh, of Zarathustra, right? the world that Zarathustra came into, every culture on earth, from the Greeks to the Indians to, I don't know, the Chinese and the Mayans, all had a cyclical view of, uh, I don't even want to call it history. I mean, they did not have history. This is Hegel's point. They had a cyclical view of time. And, you know, that was modeled, obviously, on the seasons. And so they, they believed that there wasn't any progress over the course of time and that you know the gods were an order of being ab uh, above humanity, and they had certain abilities that we don't have, and our position with respect to them is eternal. And at best, what happens is that society uh, degrades over time from like a golden age to a dark age, golden age, silver age, bronze age, and, and then a dark age. And then after this uh, cycle of decline, this, the, the uh, cycle begins over again with a new golden age, um, through the gods basically returning to the earth and setting things in order. And you see this in the Sanskrit texts and you see it in like uh, Hesiod and you know archaic Greek culture. Zarathustra is the first person to come and posit a teleological forward oriented view of history as progress driven by Sepanto Aminu, the progressive mentality of Ahura Mazda, the Titan of wisdom. And the end goal, the telos of this teleological history, is something called the Fereshgard. And Fereshgard means basically the, ref it, it, the root of that word is the same as uh, where we get fresh from in English. Fereshgard means the refreshing of the world or the radical transformation of all life to achieve a state of perfection. It's an alchemical metaphor where he envisions basically the whole earth being 
uh, covered in molten metal, the metal of the forge, and the world that comes from out of that um, uh, apocalyptic transformation is a world that perfectly instantiates fravashis or farvahars. So fravashis or farvahars are like spiritual or transcendental archetypes of things, things and people. And again, this is an idea that Plato got from Zarathustra via Pythagoras, who studied in the capital of Iran for a dozen years. In, in Zarathustra's view, that's the end of history, that our, our whole history is a forward-oriented, progressive process that will end with a radical transformation of humanity and of the world in a way that uh, instantiates these archetypes. So, yeah, I mean, futurism was born in Iran. Yeah, the contribution of Persian culture, and it seems like we more and more are beginning to realize like how much has come from Iran, but a lot of it still has been abstracted and muddied out and straight out hijacked by other cultures and you know other kind of religions, including Islam. Quoting again from your book, that the greatness, the, the greatness of the Islamic world in science and technology during the period of 900 to 1100 um, in the old Gregorian calendar had to do with the fact that 90% of the so-called Islamic scientists and in inventors were actually Persians and other Iranians. And this is uh, something that has driven me crazy since I've lived in the West for, I don't know, the past 16 years, that a lot of Westerners try to describe to me uh, the incredible role of Islam and how amazing Islam has been at some period to preserve all this science and all this technology and all of these things. Um, and I remember somebody, I, I was giving a talk uh, at a church and somebody mentioned this and some, uh, another Iranian gentleman in the crowd, he stood up and said, they were all wonderful people despite being, um, in, in spite of being Muslims. They tried to get away from Islam and they tried to get away from uh, Islam and all of that because it's something that has occupied our country for many, many, many centuries. And this is why I'm saying that a lot of the things that are becoming more and more clear, yet a lot of things have been stolen and muddied out. So this is something that Iranians now, perhaps out of uh, sheer purpose of just getting out of this devastation, they're going back and finding out what really belongs to Iran and Iranians. Yeah, I mean, it's at least 90%. If you... Uh, you could wiki this. I mean, if you if you look up like list of Iranian scientists and inventors, right? It's unbelievable. It's just, I mean, there's no question that if you do an analysis of what are the main countries or cultures from out of which um, science and technology has emerged and and you know basically technological scientific progress has been driven forward over the course of human history Iran is definitely up there with Greece uh Italy Germany Britain France Russia uh as among the top definitely within probably the top 5 um and certainly the top 10 uh in the world and during that period from about, let's say, 850 to 1150, okay, once the uh, Persians had succeeded in basically coming out from under the yoke of the caliphate uh, around um, 850 to 900, Babak Khurramdin and a bunch of other people in northern Iran like Sunbad, Ishaq, Afshin, Mazyar, they led revolts against the caliphate. And uh, this created a situation where not only was the hold of the caliphate in Baghdad over Iran weakened, but the uh, Ali Buyid, the Buyid house, was able not only to carve out a degree of autonomy, but even to essentially turn the Baghdad caliphate into its vassal by around 950. And this is when you have this great renaissance take place, this Persian renaissance take place which is wrongly branded an Islamic golden age. Not only was it not Islamic, these people, I mean, some of them were rabidly anti-Islamic. I mean, go read Drazi's writings on Muhammad and the Quran and so on and so forth. And you can see that, you know, these people had tremendous contempt for Islam. Uh, 
Ebn Sina, which was toward the tail end of that period, uh, he basically makes a confession at the end of his life that, see, so he was he was toward the end of that period when the Turks were coming in and the Turks wound up reimposing Islam in an, in an orthodox form on Iran with tremendous brutality. I mean, they genocided the country. They built pillars out of decapitated heads in some cities like Esfahan. And um, as the Turks were starting to come in and so forth, and there was this danger of the, the reinstitutionalization of Islam, uh, Ibn Sina, or Avicenna, as he's known in the West, confesses that um, he had to compromise his intellectual integrity for much of his life out of fear of what the clerics would say, and that he engaged in a lot of you know, noble lies, as it were, in his writings. Um, and you know, basically, it, it, it clues us into the fact that uh, the atmosphere of repression is returning. And then shortly thereafter, in like the period of Biruni and so forth, uh, or and, and Al Ghazali, we wind up back in in basically, um, you know, in, in under benighted Islamic tyranny, uh, which sadly persisted in Iran for many centuries after. But that period between 850 and 1150, where we had you know Razi, Khwarazmi, uh, Omar Khayyam, where Iran basically invented algebra, was uh, you know dev devising the most complex, uh, rigorous astronomical systems and you know, creating certain inventions in, in both engineering and what went on to be chemistry. Uh, Iran was a powerhouse of science and technology, and that has everything to do, you know, with the, the future that I envision for Iran in this book. Like, it is not incidental that Iran might reemerge as a center of technological science in the world, because it was that, okay? First of all, it was the impetus for the whole idea of technological science, when the Hachamanashid Empire influenced classical Greece, and then Iran emerged after the collapse of the West as, again, the bastion of science and technology from 850 to, uh, to 1150. So, so yeah, um, that's, that's definitely an important part of what I discuss in Artemis Unveiled. Yeah, and yet this occupation and hijacking of all our heroes and all our legends and our own culture continues to this day that you see, you're talking about training Promethean soldiers on the basis of this philosophy that belongs to us. Meanwhile, the Islamic Republic regime, who is an occupier from my perspective, they have introduced two credit courses of Qasem Soleimani. So they are training Qasem Soleimani soldiers, they're pushing it in universities and all that. And hey, if nothing changes in two, three generations, maybe that would be the case. But what a loss it would be that you're taking gold in order to, you know, just use it as some kind of a leverage to make yourself look a little taller. I want to talk about some, um, you talked about the past of how futurism basically was rooted in Iran. And I want to talk about more current examples also that carries out um, through Persians, you being one of uh, the most obvious and brilliant examples, but we also want to talk about Fereydun Esvanieri, FM 2030. But let me read in the context of the current ongoing Iranian revolution, again, apart from your book, that long before the modern revolutions of Iran, the Mazdakite revolution of 488-531 uh, could be identified as not only the most radical revolution of the whole world prior to the modern age, but perhaps the most pivotal event in Iran's entire history. By the time the Olympians assumed overt control over Earth through China and the United Nations, we had already built a significant network of, of our Promethean rebellion. One might even call it a bastion of resistance if it were not so decentralized by necessity. This is one of my most favorite part of your book, by the way. To the extent that there was a center at all, the densest concentration of nodes that came to be Iran. Yes, so um, I have this vision of blockchain technology and cryptocurrency combining to turn Iran into a rival of the world economy managed by an oppressive United Nations. So in, in my narrative, I make the case for why, as unlikely as it may seem, China and Russia will in the end decide to exercise their hegemony through the structure of the United Nations. And this has a lot to do with 
the role that I think plan uh, that I think France is going to play in the conclusion of my forecasted third world war. So I I think frankly we're already in it. Okay. I I'm agree. St I'm sticking my neck out a bit to say this, but. I would say that the uh, Russian uh, operation in Ukraine was the beginning of the Third World War, um, and that we, we, you know, it's like we're 1939, 1940. People don't realize yet that it's a world war, but we're in it, and it's going to expand to include Taiwan and so on and so forth. And very significantly, it's going to expand, I think, to include a theater of combat in the Middle East between Israel and the Islamic Republic. And what I predict in Artemis Unveiled is that France is going to play a key role in ending this war that around about 2027, France is going to flip and it will make a separate peace with Russia, but then convince the Chinese and the Russians as the victors of the Third World War that they ought to still keep the United Nations and use it as a kind of Aberu, kind of like whitewash, you know, to legitimate their hegemony through quote unquote international law and so forth. And so the UN winds up being transformed. I mean, this is already happening to some extent, but the UN winds up being transformed into this regressive backwards uh, institution that is all about protecting cultural rights. Okay, in other words, reaffirming retarded customs and superstitions and, you know, backwards practices of, of various societies, including in the Islamic world. And so things like, you know, the, the various conventions on cultural rights that were passed like in 2000, around about 2000 at the UN, they trump the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the worst elements of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from, 20, uh, from 1948 are exploited in order to like, let's say, use freedom of religion and freedom of choosing the form of education uh, in a manner that affords traditional Muslims the ability to have their children educated at madrasas, right? So, so the UN and its various conventions are exploited as a means to reaffirm, protect, and fortify backwards and repressive cultures. And in this context, I portray an Iran or a Promethean Persia that has become the hub of a global blockchain crypto network. In other words, the, the densest concentration of nodes in a, uh, in a blockchain network that obviously being the, the, you know, the working from the deepest strata of the internet is a global network. Um, and also the center of an alternate economy, a black economy, based on cryptocurrency exchanges, private, stable cryptocurrency exchanges. And so this, this Iran winds up resisting the attempt to uh, basically entirely manage the world economy in a socialistic manner uh, by the United Nations or, or by China and Russia through the ages of the United Nations. So that this is the kind of uh, struggle that I set up where, you know, you have this Promethean community that's worldwide, but Iran becomes a kind of bastion or fortress for it, a kind of a modern alamut uh, that is resisting the tyranny led by the, the Chinese and uh, the tyranny whose discourse is traditionalism and deindustrialization and basically an ideology inimical to progress. Yeah, so Iran basically will become a pirate state uh, with concentration of decentralized modes of resistance. And this is possible because you're envisioning that the next central government of Iran is not going to be as powerful to create some kind of a monopoly and power across the country. And um, a lot of this will achieve will be achieved with the help and a partnership that will be made between Iran and Israel. Again, going back to your book, you're saying that when the rest of the world turned its back on Israel and when contempt for the Jews reached the new Zenith, suppressing that of 1930s, the Persian griffin of post-Islamic Iran took Israel and the Jewish diaspora under her wings. Israel, in turn, joined Iran and thereby also joined forces with Prometheism to become a new David standing against the Goliath of an emerging Chinese global hegemony wrapped in the flag of the United Nations. So 
I mean, folks should read the book, you know, the devil's in the details, but long story short, here's what I think is going to happen. Uh, for better or for worse, okay, Israel is going to launch strikes on the Iranian nuclear facilities. Seems this is inevitable. Going, yeah, this is going to happen. Uh, now that the nuclear, you know, now, now that basically um, uh, the West, in particular the United States, is being uncooperative in terms of reining in Iran's nuclear program, um, and now that I would say 90% of the population have turned against the Islamic Republic. I mean, look, let me just make a side note here that I think it was two months ago, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad came out and called Ayatollah Khamenei satanic. Of course, I would say this is an insult to Satan and he should be flipping his moral terms. But in any case, he came out and called Ayatollah Khamenei satanic and called for the replacement of the Islamic Republic and the writing of a new constitution. If you remember back to 2009, I was you know, very involved as an activist in the uprising of 2009 as a solidarity demonstration organizer and someone lobbying the UN Security Council to pass sanctions against these people in Sepa that were brutalizing the population and so forth. And I, you know, if you remember back in 2009, it was a struggle between Mir Hossein Mousavi, who was the, op the candidate running against Ahmadinejad, and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who supposedly uh, frauded the election or had people fraud the election in order to secure his reelection, right? And so he, here was this struggle between these two figures, Musavi and Ahmadinejad. Well, Musavi, like six months ago, came out during his house arrest and said, it's over. The Constitution has to be rewritten. The Islamic Republic has failed. And he's one of the founders of the Islamic Republic who was prime minister while Ayatollah Khomeini was leading the state. Yeah, favored by Khomeini, by the way, over Khomeini. Yes, yes. <laughs> and now you have his rival, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. All these people got killed in these protests in a struggle between Musavi and Ahmadinejad. And now both Musavi and Ahmadinejad are saying this regime is finished. We need a new constitution. All right. Well, that's indicative, OK, of the fact that this regime is on its last legs. Ninety percent of the population is against this regime. And you think that the Israelis are not going to take that opportunity? to carry out finally these strikes on Iran's nuclear facilities? Of course they will. Moreover, it's been Benjamin Netanyahu's life goal to do so, and he's facing considerable opposition. He's kind of been in and out of power repeatedly, and this is his last chance, okay? So he's not gonna get another shot at this. Meanwhile, there are serious internal sociopolitical difficulties in Israel. So it would be a way that you know Netanyahu could kind of like forcibly shore up unity at home by starting a war abroad. So I see this attack taking place probably by 2025. And it's it's quite predictable what will happen. Uh, the IRGC will strike back with everything it has at Israel, in Lebanon, in Syria, you know, everywhere. Through all its proxies, Hamas, Hezbollah. All out war. All out, all out. And then the Israelis will come back in a second wave, both with their air force and with their submarines in the Persian Gulf. And they're gonna hit every single IRGC target in Iran. Every single IRGC target. Netanyahu had a meeting with the president of France. I think it was, it was about a year ago, and he was trying to convince Macron to uh, basically join in in a uh, operation to strike Iran. And on the table were 2,000 targets inside Iran that Netanyahu was trying to convince Macron to help him strike. Anyway, the French didn't agree, but point being, they have a, a very wide battle plan, and I have no doubt that in the second, the first wave will be the nuclear facilities. The second wave is going to be the IRGC. And see, at that point, they are taking out the principal repressive organ inside the country. The, the Islamic Republic cannot survive without the IRGC because, you know, these Hezbollahis, these people, these uh, Basijis, the, the militia who are basically, you know, uh, chain gangs wielding chains and clubs and vigilantes, hooligans. Thugs. They're thugs. They need that organizational structure of the IRGC behind them. And technically, like they report to the IRGC. They're like a, a, mil a militia volunteer uh, wing of the IRGC. If the IRGC is crushed, these vestiges are not going to be able to do much. And so I think it's going to be Israel, for better or for worse, that creates. Um, 
the conditions for the final overthrow of this regime by the people, okay? Uh, somewhere between 2025 and let's say 2027 or so. Uh, but I think that that as you as you suggested, you know, quoting from from my book, that following the collapse of the Islamic Republic, uh, Iran is going to face very serious internal difficulties. First of all, the majority of the economy is controlled by the IRGC or its proxies. They can they control you know all the major industries. I mean, even cement is is poured by the IRGC in Iran. They control all the best banks in Iran. And so you're going to have a, a very devastating economic collapse and see the opposition, the so-called Iranian opposition, including, by the way, Reza Pahlavi, who went to Israel two months ago and his host in Israel, his personal chaperone, was the head of Israeli intelligence, uh, Gila Gamal or something like that. The lady. So, yeah, th this woman... The head, their head of intelligence was his personal host throughout his entire visit in Israel. Well, that sends you a very strong signal of what's about to come, okay? Um, but in any case, this opposition thinks that after the Iranian economy is destroyed through the uh, basically crushing of the IRGC and its, and its proxies, that the West is gonna come in and rebuild Iran. But see, that's not gonna happen because the West itself is in a state of collapse. As much as they wanna deny it, um, by the end of the Third World War, the Chinese and Russians will have succeeded in destroying what is left of the Western economy, and especially the United States. I think there's going to be economic devastation, the like of which we haven't seen since the Great Depression in this country. And the West will be in no position to rebuild Iran. So then the question becomes, OK, well, first of all, how is Iran going to have an economy again after this? And then the second is, uh, or maybe this is an even more serious concern, secessionism. You have all these uh, ethnic separatists like Azadis who claim to be Turks because the Turks came and imposed their language on, on some uh, uh, Northwest Iranians in the, in the you know, beginning of the 1100s. And uh, Kurds who are being funded by the Saudis, who are being funded by Israel. Uh, in order to um, foment separatism in northwestern Iran. And then the Baluch in, uh, you know, south um, eastern Iran on the border with Pakistan, uh, you have also um, these Baluchi separatists who are associated with Islamic fundamentalist elements. They're like the, basically the Taliban of Iran. And, you know, it's not a, a coincidence that the majority of protests that continue against the Islamic Republic are based around Zahedan in Baluchistan and around places like Sana and Daj in Kurdistan. And this is not a coincidence. It's because these are the groups that are receiving the most funding and backing from foreign forces like you know, uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia and so forth, and Pakistan and so forth. And so we're going to face a serious danger of secessionism in Iran. And what I depict in Artemis Unveiled is a situation where following the fall of the Islamic Republic, you have this really you know, liberal, democratic, uh, weak central government in power in Tehran, something like the Weimar Republic in Germany, you know, and um, it is not capable of preventing attempts at secession in these provinces. And it's also really ineffective at reconstituting Iran's economy, given the collapse of the West. And given the fact that I mean, you have to understand that Iranian people hate China and Russia now because of the degree of support uh, that they've given to the Islamic Republic as basically the third member of their Axis uh, coalition. And so it's not like China and Russia are going to come in and save the Iranian economy either. OK, uh, so this government will be very ineffective at rebuilding the Iranian economy. They're going to be dealing with threats of secessionism. And I portray a scenario where Prometheism as a decentralized global pirat piratical movement uh, with a blockchain communications and, and trade network and a cryptocurrency based economy comes in and helps to reconstitute the economy of Iran, partly by allowing Iran to become a hub for banned lines of technological research and development 
like advanced forms of genetic engineering and other types of, you know, uh, cybernetic tech. Look, you have calls all across the board now for moratoriums on artificial intelligence research, even coming from some of the top engineers in the field. And so this is another area of technological research and development that, uh, you know, could be shielded by a blockchain network and that could take place um, in secure facilities in or around Iran, like, for example, a seastead in the Persian Gulf, which I describe in the book, uh, or a seastead in the South Caspian Sea, and where, you know, in, in loose affiliation with, if not the Iranian government, some kind of deep state in Iran that's quasi-corporate, you have these lines of research and development continue, and Prometheism thereby affords Iran an avenue for exotic uh, industrial and economic development outside of the control net imposed by China and the United Nations, right? And then in terms of the danger of secessionism, well, the solution could be something like Blackwater, a, a corporate militia which is hired by putatively private interests in order to provide security. So like, for example, this is Iranian or including non-Iranians? It would include people from all over the world. But let's say uh, under those conditions that I described, probably you'd have a lot more highly motivated Iranians joining that organization than you would have people from other countries. And so it could be disproportionately constituted by Iranians. And so you could, look, it's a situation where you have significant numbers of Persians living right now in Kurdistan, in Azerbaijan, in both of the Azerbaijan provinces, um, in Khuzestan, in Baluchistan. The majority of wealth is controlled by the Persians who live there, not by these ethnic minorities who want to secede. And suppose these Persians have businesses and they're concerned for the security of their corporations under conditions where ethnic separatists are engaging in terrorism and so forth, right? So these corporations could hire private security to come in and basically secure their uh, corporate domains. Well, under this guise, it would also be possible to maintain Persian control over sensitive archaeological sites like Bisutun in, uh, in Kurdistan or uh, Taghabustan. So ancient Hakamanashid and Sasanid archaeological sites that are very important could wind up as an extension of this kind of a policy uh, being protected from what happened to um, you know, Nineveh and Mosul in Iraqi Kurdistan, right, uh, under ISIS. So, so you see, I mean, this is a model that we could also employ, I mean, that Prometheism could employ to guarantee physical security in Iran in addition to uh, economic recovery. It's like Persian Promethean crypto anarchy. Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, love it. Um, let's talk a little more about the secessionist. I promise I'll go back to um, FM 2030. Um, you mentioned Baluch and Azeris. Let's talk about Azerbaijan as an example. The president of Israel is in Azerbaijan now, in, um, in the country of Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan is being used in a way as a center to uh, gather all these forces against the Iranians. Israel has a very close connection to them. And Turkey also said that the security of Azerbaijan is basically security of Turkey. And uh, NATO um, has started bringing troops uh, to Azerbaijan. So uh, my question is, obviously, these uh, secessionist movements, first of all, it will create a fertile ground for this liberal democratic woke kind of a perspective to just get in and so even you know more um, hatred among these different factions to divide the country. So that's one thing that people need to realize when they go on out and say this country has to become a liberal country or a progressive country or something like that. But at the same time, all these movements, you, you mentioned that most of the protests are coming from Baluchistan and Zahedan. Their secession is some of them, um, but they are fighting against the common enemy. So it will be like an enemy of my enemy is my friend. And it will create the kind of a chaos that just, again, quoting you, you say, you say that chaos may be Pandora's box, but at the bottom of that box is hope itself. So if it's not 
uh, something that can be avoided, maybe it's something that can be capitalized on until we get to the other side of this and try to implement different kind of measures like uh, what you said with respect to uh, private, private security, private militias. Look, I don't think it's even a question. I mean, that's obviously going to be the case. I mean, whether whether we like it or not, the Islamic Republic is partly going to be overthrown through ethnic, uh, let's say, re ethnically based resistance movements. Th there's just no doubt about it. I mean, that's what's going to happen. OK, uh, so we have to figure out how to use that most effectively in order to develop the strongest possible Iran afterwards. And, and you know, an Iran that can become a spearhead for the global struggle to continue human progress and to uh, you know fight for independence from those forces that would like to tyrannize over us. That's what we need to do. So we, yeah, you know, sure. Um, I mean, it's just a political reality of the situation. And in terms of Azerbaijan, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, if uh, the so-called Republic of Azerbaijan, which of course is a fake country, is used as a staging ground for um, military operations against Iran by Israel. I wouldn't be at all surprised. And uh, Reza Pahlavi in Israel, I think this goes along the same line that I saw it as some kind of a middle finger to the Biden administration by the Israelis that we, we, you know, we have our own plan and we even have our candidate basically to install or whatever or to help to get in power. But exactly because of that, Iran would not have a strong central government because, uh, you know, Reza Pahlavi is a very, very divisive kind of a figure. And he has played that role really well. If that is a role, or maybe it's not a role, that every time that something was close to the climax, this guy has come in and basically has occupied whatever kind of a movement, whatever kind of a um, approach. And then people around him, that some people are like, oh, he can't really control them. These are the worst kind of fascists that somebody was talking about it, if they're treating Iranian protesters and Iranians who are not aligned or don't agree with Reza Pahlavi like this before the success of the re revolution outside of Iran, what are they going to do to people <laughs> when they have guns and monopoly on power in Iran? Exactly. And so I think that uh, part of the way we will wind up with a Promethean Persia is through a dialectical reaction against the kind of government that he's going to be. I hate to even use the word leading because he's not a leader and he's not going to be leading anything. But the kind of government that Reza Pahlavi will be the figurehead of and the, the, fa the public face of is going to very quickly provoke um, e extreme criticism and ultimately poten potentially violent reaction. Uh, because that government is going to increasingly become responsible for the demise of the country. Uh, it, it is not going to be able to repair a wrecked economy because, again, they, they think they're completely dependent on the West. They think, and by the West, I mean the existing global banking system, you know, and these corporate cartels and so forth. And they think those those folks are going to come out and bail them. Those folks are going to be destroyed in the Third World War. Mark my words. Nobody's going to be there to bail them out other than a potential partnership actually with Israel, which I outline in the book, um, that for certain reasons, the Israelis are also going to be very isolated in the 2030s, and they're going to have serious problems of their own. And it's going to turn out that the, the very broad and deep background of the, the ancient Persian, uh, you know, Israeli Israelite relationship uh, will reemerge as the basis for a deep cooperation between Iran and Israel. Uh, and in that way, I think, you know, Iran will find an unusual ally and vice versa. But, the, you know, the people around Reza Pahlavi think the West is going to come to bail them out and they have no plan of their own. And so they're going to be basically uh, presiding over, uh, you know, a, a, a beleaguered economy and quickly resentment will build against that regime. And there's going to be an opportunity at that point for some kind of a shift in power to take place in Iran. I would say probably in the early 2030s or so. Um, and that's what we have to focus on in terms of, you know, a, a Promethean vision of geopolitics is that moment of opportunity in Iran sometime in the early 2030s uh, 
figureheaded by Reza Pahlavi has basically run its course and people are ready for something else. Yeah, some kind of a Promethean partnership between Iran and Israel and on the side of Iran that is based on what we talked about in the beginning, something that belongs to Iran and has evolved throughout the globe and now is coming back to Iran, it seems like, uh, in the very, very key moment. So let's talk about Freydun Esfanieri, FM2030, who I think it's worth mentioning that the first time I heard his name was through Natasha Vidimor. Natasha Vidimor, a very prominent figure in transhumanist um, circles and a very prominent transhumanist. She also wrote the Transhumanist Manifesto. I don't know if they were married, but they, they were definitely um, in a relationship for, I think, nine, ten, ten years. And then Natasha Vidimor married another prominent transhumanist, um, Max Moore, who I know a little closer. But uh, please uh, talk about uh, Frey Dunes Van Yeri, FM 2030, and his contribution to this, um, to this whole Promethean reemergence of Iran and Iranian culture. And I believe that he also coined the term transhumanist and transhumanism by himself. Yeah, in the 1980s, um, Frey Dunes Van Yeri, who by that time uh, had changed his name to FM 2030, right? Feridun M. Esfandiari, because he believed the technological singularity was going to arrive uh, in 2030. Initially, he thought 2020, and then later he revised it to 2030. And so by the 80s, when he was going around calling himself FM 2030, he uh, actually coined this term transhumanism in this book called Are You a Transhuman um, from, the, from the 80s. And he was going around doing interviews with Larry King and so on and so forth in that era. But the opening quotes in, in Artemis Unveiled are from his uh, 1977 book, Upwingers, which I think is his best work. And in Upwingers, Esfandiari, he does a number of things. But you know, uh, beginning with the title of the book, he formulates a kind of sociopolitics that's beyond the dichotomy between left wing and right wing. And he points out that, look, um, although leftists have conventionally been considered the progressives on the political spectrum, that's not really the case anymore. He was looking at the cancellation of Apollo in the late 1970s and you know how the left in America wanted to defund Apollo because they wanted to put more money into social welfare programs. Uh, and he was also looking at basically leftist critiques of things like biotechnology as too eugenic that you know these pe people on the left uh, are afraid of genetic engineering because it reminds them of uh, Nazi eugenics and whatever as if by the way Nazi Germany was the leader in eugenics which it wasn't the leader in eugenics was Sweden okay and then America also but you know way ahead of, of the Germans but be that as it may um, you often find leftists uh, op opposed to genetic engineering, even though, you know, I mean, it, it could tremendously augment, uh, enhance uh, and empower uh, humanity in all kinds of ways, from enhancement of intelligence to elimination of all kinds of hereditary diseases. Um, often the arguments against it come from the left rather than the right, because people on the right don't believe in excessive government regulation. So they don't think that the government should be in the business of regulating the use of these kinds of technologies. That should be a decision left to the private individual. Uh, and companies should be allowed to offer their services in the free market. That's a quote unquote right wing position. And so in some cases, as Fandiari noted, actually the right is more conducive of uh, progress than the left. And um, a deeper layer of this argument uh, goes back to um, an analysis of Marx and of the common presupposition of both communist and capitalist economics. Esfandiari argued that he actually appreciated Marx a lot. He says a lot of complimentary things about Marx in Marx's own historical context. But then he goes on to say that both Marxism and capitalism commonly presuppose a scarcity economy, an economy where there's a, only finite resources and where industrial production requires uh, basically 
mass hard labor. And so you need to figure out, you know, basically um, how to secure humane conditions for workers and how to redistribute finite resources. But Esfandiari argues that, you know, in the coming decades, we're going to have both what he calls teletechnology, meaning basically ways of doing things remotely, and cybernetic technology uh, that basically allows for autonomous production. We're going to have this telecybernetic development in the coming decades that allows for a largely autonomous industry to produce unlimited wealth. So we're going to move from out of the conditions that are the basic presupposition for both capitalist uh, economics and also the communist idea of redistribution of resources. Post-scarcity. Post-scarcity, a post-scarcity economy of abundance made possible by what we would today call singularity level technologies, what he called um, telecybernetic technologies. And he basically envisioned a bunch of technical councils, group, groups of technocrats, of, of experts being set up in various parts of the world and being uh, organized under sort of the, the, let's say, general guidance of a universal technical council to help to manage this largely autonomous uh, industry and economy that would produce such abundant wealth that re re resource re redistribution was no longer necessary. And even more importantly, a kind of economy that essentially secured a life of leisure for most people, where you know large-scale blue-collar labor would no longer be necessary. So the whole leftist discourse of humane conditions for workers would be rendered irrelevant by the fact that you know people would have to work only really a few hours a day or a few days a week, and mostly their work would consist of what we would call a vocation of something that's their passion that gives them. Uh, th that's intrinsically rewarding and enriching for them in their lives, rather than some kind of drudgery. And obviously, you know, he saw this coming into being through robotics and also through uh, what we would today describe as the internet. I mean, he didn't have the internet in 1977 when he was writing this, but he envisioned a global, remote, cybernetic network. Well, that's the internet, okay? And he, he describes things you know, in, in very clear terms uh, that today have become, let's say, Google Earth and, and you know, uh, uh, video, instantaneous video communications through the internet. He describes these things already in 1977. So, so that's, you know, one uh, line of argument in um, Upwingers. But where I think Esfandiari's uh, Iranian um, heritage really comes out most clearly, uh, and, and where, you know, Esfandiari is someone on the same trajectory that um, Zarathustra provided the impetus for, is in his argument that we are coming up against a change that is not merely historical, but represents an evolutionary leap, that Technolo I mean, essentially, he was formulating the concept of the technological singularity, that basically it's no longer a question of the rate of progress in various industries or uh, the invention of one or another piece of technology or, you know, uh, particular innovations that are going to, let's say, improve our quality of life or, you know, afford us certain capacities we didn't have before. The very definition of humanity is going to come under question because there's a convergence of these different types of technological developments toward our being able to modify our basic biological and cognitive conditions. And he's, he advocated very unapologetically and unequivocally for the uh, reshaping of the human form of embodiment from something arbitrarily determined by natural selection into something that um, you know, we design ourselves to basically uh, allow for a greater deg degree of flourishing and to afford us capacities, you know, that, that we haven't been uh, endowed with by nature, right? Yeah, because natural selection was 
natural selection was a necessity because we didn't have a strong enough of a computation power. Right, and we didn't have genetic engineering or uh, you know, the ability to basically augment our organism with cybernetic components. And so as Van Diori is describing basically, you know, cyborgs and, and genetically engineered hybrids, which would include, let's say, genes spliced in from other animals that have capacities that humans don't have, types of vision, types of hearing that humans don't have beyond the range of human perception, and beings who would be, let's say, for example, more suited to endure the stresses of space. One of the, the uh, you know, things that Esfand Yari adamantly advocates in this book is that we need to go beyond the earth. That, you know, there were these people who, who uh, presumably when we were living in caves, were afraid of wandering beyond the cave. And then there were people who were afraid of wandering outside their homestead. And then people who didn't want to leave the village, uh, you know, and then, then of course, nationalism, right? Um, and by the way, on that, on that, let me just make a note, you know, I've never been a nationalist. People have this impression that I'm a nationalist, you know, and that I, I've been advocating nationalism or something. No, Iran has only ever been important to me because of what Iran gave to humanity in terms of the evolution of consciousness, okay? And that's why Iran remains important to me because I don't think Iran's role in that respect is done by any means, right? Uh, but, you know, exactly. Isfandiar exactly. is very much against nationalism as another form of don't leave the cave mentality, mm -hmm. right? And he says the next phase of that is don't leave the earth. <laughs> and, you know, it's just as retarded as the people who said, don't leave the cave, don't leave the village. And so our destiny is to expand out throughout the solar system and the wider cosmos and encounter other forms of life and, uh, you know, uh, basically go through whatever transformations of consciousness and society would be attendant to a deep engagement with, you know, alien life forms and, and uh, radically different uh, forms of social organization. Now, he also proposes some very radical forms of social reorganization himself. I mean, he thinks that, uh, I mean, some, some of the most um, outside the box ideas in Upwingers have to do with his saying that in the kind of society that these types of technology are going to make possible, basically monogamy is going to be like a, a regressive outdated form of social organization and that children really it's the responsibility of society to raise children which you know given the kind of public programs we have right now is a really disturbing thought but he's he's imagining a completely different type of society which would be responsible for the cultivation of the intellect and the ethos of children and I think what he's really concerned with is making sure that children are raised as citizens of the world and not as people brainwashed and inculcated with the prejudices of their parents. So, so anyway, he has some radical ideas of social organization. And in this respect, I would also say he's very Iranian. If you go back to the Mazdakites, I mean, people don't understand this about Iranian history. That we had a movement in Iran, which I, again, I, I know I've discussed, I've discussed this in scholarly works. I devoted, I think, two chapters to it in Iranian Leviathan, um, and I've given many interviews where I've, where I've gone into it in depth. But I bring it up again in Artemis Unveiled, uh, that in Iran, from around 220 AD to 850 AD, okay, just try to wrap your mind around this idea, like, okay, America's only existed for less than 300 years, United States of America. Less than 300 years. But in Iran, for 600 years, we had a movement that basically was arguing for the late 1960s kind of hippie anarchist way of life um, uh, where you would have free love and like, you know, um, you know uh, so socialism motivated by uh, the ideals of progress and, uh, you know, human flourishing. And this movement arose in Fars, in, in Persia proper, in opposition to 
the orthodox state being set up by Ardashir Babakan, or Ardashir Babakan, the founder of the Sassanid dynasty, had these very repressive totalitarian ideas about how to create an orthodox church from out of Zoroastrianism and make it the state religion of the, of the new regime that he was setting up as he overthrew the Parthians. And there was a revolt against Ardashir by these people who were led initially by this guy called Zardosht. So he's the second Zarathustra, Zardosht of Fars in the, in the 200s AD. And this movement goes on for centuries until in the 500s, the prime minister under uh, Shah Kavad, Kavad I, his prime minister Mazdak is a representative of this movement. And at that point, Mazdak essentially leads a coup d'etat where he turns this ideology into the ideology of the Sassanid state. And for one entire generation, for 35 years, the whole freaking empire is governed according to this ideology. This is insane. Yeah. This has never happened in any country on earth. Okay, I mean, you, the French Revolution failed after a few years, after a few years, a lot of crazy shit happened that, during the French Revolution, cult of reason, reign of terror, all that. But it ended with Napoleon Bonaparte reestablishing both monarchy and Catholicism as the official religion of France. That experiment lasted only a few years. Russian Revolution, 1917. You had a lot of interesting, crazy ideas at the beginning. You had, you know, various anarchists, you know, Bakunin and, you know, Kropotkin and all these interesting people. And you had the Russian um, uh, cosmists. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky and very, very, you know, futurist uh, revolutionary thinking. But within a few years, it turned into a totalitarian bureaucracy, right? So nowhere in human history have you seen what took place in Iran bet between 488 and 530, okay, when Mazdak was ultimately martyred together with uh, 100,000 of his leading um, uh, well, his of the leaders of the movement, not followers, 100,000 of the leader. What kind of movement was this that their top people consisted of 100,000 individuals? And you have to imagine against the background of the population of that time. So we're talking about a mass execution carried out by Khosro Anushiravan, yeah, right? Khosro Dadgar, yes. Right. Oh, how just, how just, <laughs> right? So you're talking about an execution that if you measured it in today's population would be millions of people. Mm -hmm. That's a hell of a movement to, to put it down. You need to kill that many people and go around burning their books and bonfires and so on and so forth. Anyway, despite that attempt at repression, it's exactly this movement that then produces Babak, Babak Khurramdin in the 800s, the main partisan fighter against the Arabian Caliphate is a Mazdakite. And he's it, clearly, if you read the texts, his mission was the basically resurrection of Mazdakism. And so this movement somehow has survived yet again for several more centuries, and it's the spearhead of resistance against the caliphate and creates the conditions ultimately for the Ali Bouye, you know, to, to basically carve out a space where this Persian Renaissance takes place, this, you know, this uh, Renaissance of science and technology that is misnamed as an Islamic golden age. This is something which I discuss in Artemis Unveiled and which a lot of people don't understand about Iran is that it has been the most radical laboratory for social experimentation in all of human history. Wow. Very interesting that Mazdak was one guy and it took killing him and 100,000 of his followers to stop that movement and they couldn't stop it. And they couldn't right? stop it. But it just reminds me of how a flicker of light can destroy a thousand years of darkness. And this goes back to eternal fire. And it's completely related to what's going on here, because now they want to ban in the West gas stoves. Right. And I keep telling people gas stoves are an excuse. They're after the fire itself, which goes back to this relationship between humanity and technology. And it seems to me that fundamentally at the core of it there are forces of prometheism uh, or however you want to you can call it progress whatever it is who are in favor of adopting these technologies using them for the betterment of humanity you know genetic engineering getting out of earth and all that and then there are forces against these progress actual progress who we talked about alexander dugan 
how his ideology and how his um, way of thinking is being used by globalists who basically plan to deindustrialize large parts of the planet because they believe that people don't deserve the singularity level technology. So it really goes back to there. And exactly because of this core existence of fire at the core of this Iranian futurism and philosophy that I think it's so important to talk about the contribution of Persia and Iran and Persia and Persians to the rest of the world and to the rest of the civilization, really. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a reason why this is my symbol, right? <laughs> okay. Um, the reason they want to get rid of the gas stoves is because they know that there's going to be something like the Carrington event very soon. The Carrington event in the 1800s, late 1800s, around the time the telegraph was invented, was a coronal mass ejection, a massive solar storm, which um, didn't affect very much at that time because we didn't really have elect electric uh, any electric grid to speak of at that time. We did have the first telegraph lines that were being laid and it burned them completely and they had to be totally uh, re relayed. Um, but were that type of event to happen today and we're overdue for it, if that a type of uh, level of solar storm were to take place today, it would fry uh, the entire power grid in the hemisphere um, that was subjected to it. And so if you don't have a gas stove, you're gonna be in deep shit when that happens, okay? And so they want, and that's also why they're promoting electric cars, because they want you to be in as deep shit as possible when that happens. They want you to be stranded, isolated, and dependent entirely on them. That's what's going on here, because these forces ultimately want to, to not only slow and stop progress, they want to regress us into some kind of a uh, medieval feudal type of state. Um, and look, they have no other choice. Because here's the thing, in these recent conversations where like Elon Musk is saying, you know, we need to put a six month moratorium on artificial intelligence research, or you have this crazy messianic Jew uh, who's who's uh, saying that's not, that's not enough? We need a total moratorium on Elitzer Elitzer Yudkowsky. Yes, and he he thinks there should be a total moratorium, and if there isn't one, like life is going to end in six years, the world's going to end. Oh, he wants to bomb data centers, and I have to say that Steve Bannon all of a sudden became the biggest fan of Elitzer Yudkowsky, saying that 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 that's what needs to done needs to happen. So this is exactly my point. Uh, this is exactly my point, Alga, is that you see, short of, it's not enough to bomb data centers. Because if you take the AI and you shield it inside a blockchain network, there is no way to take out that thing unless you nuke every server on the earth, okay? So, and they're not gonna do that. I mean, they don't want a global thermonuclear holocaust. So what's the only other way you're gonna stop us reach, reaching the technological singularity through AI? Uh, there's a number of different pathways toward the technological singularity. When John, I think it was John von Neumann, originally theorized this, I mean, way back, like it was the 60s or something like that, way back. He outlined a number of different potential pathways to technological singularity. And at some level, they're all convergent with the others, right? But it's a question of which one leads in. And one of them could have been genetic engineering, but because of, you know, including massive human IQ enhancement. But because of the history of eugenics and all that, what happened with the Second World War, that turned out not to be the path. The path looks like it's AI. And so the only way you're going to stop us from reaching the singularity through AI is short of a global thermonuclear holocaust that like get, you know, literally incinerates all the servers, is you have to find a way to destroy industrial civilization. That's what you have to do. You have to make it so that People aren't even thinking of going on computers and engineering AI anymore. Computers don't exist anymore. You have to basically t take us back into medievalism. And that's the plan. There is an orchestrated plan right now to basically use a series of converging catastrophes, pandemics and other things, geophysical, apparently natural catastrophes having to do with, you know, earthquakes and tsunamis and so on and so forth. You, you know, they're tectonic weapons right now. The latest generation of weapons being developed by the Russians and by ourselves are weapons that can emulate nat natural catastrophes like earthquakes and superstorms and things like that, create tsunamis. And so you're going to have these converging catastrophes that basically set us back 
centuries and, and prepare us to be lorded over in a medieval feudal fashion. And that's the only way that they can stop AI. I mean, they're right that they have no other choice. So, so then Prometheism in those terms is the, you know, banner of resistance against such an outcome. I mean, the battle lines are very clearly drawn. We represent the persistence of progress. I thought it was very interesting when um, that letter came out, they, they asked for the moratorium, which, you know, to me, when someone like Elon Musk asked for moratorium, it basically is to shut down the competition because, like, he's not slowing down. But at the same time, very shortly after that, Facebook's or Meta's large language model was leaked, quote unquote. And the head of AI at Meta, um, Ian LeCun, He's, he's completely in favor of open systems, open source, and has been very vocal against the centralization because, you know, those people understand exactly what's going on. Maybe they don't talk about it because, you know, most people will be like, even though I got to tell you, even a year ago, if I was talking about these things with most people, they were like a oh, conspiracy theorist, whatever, whatever. But we just had a flood. I told you we got flooded. Our house got flooded like a month and a half ago. And a lot of people were saying this is like this has never happened in 60 years that we were living here. Maybe this is a weather weapon that they're using it. So it's becoming something that, you know, especially after that virus, people are becoming less and less trusting of the narrative of the establishment of the status quo. And this opens up a lot of uh, opportunities for people to be open to new things and new developments and new adventures and technologies. But at the same time, that's exactly why the status quo is getting more uh, overtly violent, overtly aggressive, overtly totalitarian. Yin and yang, though. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, I know for a fact these weapons exist. I mean, if you talk, talk to any top military experts, they will tell you that that's the case. And you could, I mean, I don't want to give, I'm not giving anyone any ideas. They know this already, and I think they have it in the cards. I actually think they might have actually tried to do this already once, but you could use a tectonic weapon once to destabilize the uh, the flank of um, Las Palmas uh, and trigger the Cumbre Vieja uh, volcano to erupt with an earthquake that results in a landslide of one side of that island, okay, into the Atlantic Ocean. And that single tectonic event would lead to a tsunami that would drown all of the cities of the East Coast of the United States, including New York. Just one use of a tectonic weapon. So, you know, there's all, let me put it to you this way. If as we get into World War III, you start to notice that we have this terrible misfortune of constant natural, natural catastrophes, understand that the Third World War is being fought by other means, by all sides, okay? And so I think that um, between 2025 and 2030, uh, the world as we know it is really going to come apart to a very large extent. And you're going to have a, a really demoralized, disoriented population by 2030, which sadly is largely going to be, um, you know, put into a cattle pen by the United Nations and told what to do and how, you know, the economy is going to be managed for the sake of our survival and, you know, recovery and all this bullshit. And so my vision is for Promethean Persia to stand as a spearhead against that as part of a global piratical movement. The solution is technology. This is only a tool that can defeat a tool. Right? You can like pray and stuff yeah. and hope that it will go away. So let's talk about technology itself. What is the meaning? What is the definition of technology? Because let me give you an example I've been thinking about. That a piece of stick on the ground is not technological. It's not, it's not a tool. It could be like biologically technological, but it's not a tool in a sense that we're talking about technology. But if the same stick is picked up by a chimp to reach for a fruit and the higher branches, it automatically, the exact same piece of stick becomes a piece of tool and a technology. So what is the definition of technology? What is the, def uh, what is the essence of it? So Heidegger, this was a question that, that, you know, really preoccupied Heidegger in the mid to late part of his career. Uh, I mean, the essence of technology, that was at the core of the series of essays that he wrote that are collated under the title, The Question Concerning Technology. And 
my understanding of what technology is has been partly informed by that. But I also go, I think Heidegger had a very naturalistic romanticism still in his thinking. And so I've also gone in, in a lot of ways beyond Heidegger um, through, I think, probably more Nietzschean thinking uh, about evolution and, and evolution as the will to power. And the view that I've come to is a pretty radical one, which is that, uh, so think, think about it this way. Humans didn't make technology. Technology made humans, right? So yep. as we're saying, I mean, chimps play with sticks and they, they dig in holes for ants and stuff with sticks. That's tool use. Yep. And it was tool, and you know, these flint stones, the flint, flint stones that were used, uh, you know, for making fire and, uh, you know, for as weapons by hominids. It's these kinds of tools which allowed us to hunt and cook food that then modified the structure of the human jaw and ultimately the human skull to allow for the evolution of the brain that was then capable of devising more sophisticated tool use, which ultimately led to the homo sapiens in the first place. So technology precedes humanity. So then what, what is technology? I would say that the people who frame this binary between technology and nature are mistaken. Technology is itself a force of nature. Technology is evolution operating at a certain cognitive stage. In other words, once information processing becomes sufficiently sophisticated in nature, you have this phenomenon that we call technology. The cosmos as a whole is an information processing system. We live in a quantum computational information processing system. And the, the quantum computation on a cosmic scale is inextricable from consciousness. And technology represents the teleology of that evolutionary process in the cosmos, on the scale of the cosmos. In other words, it is intrinsic to evolution for technological beings to evolve and for the technological beings to then engage in the directed evolution of the cosmos from there on forward, right? So it, if we could look on a larger scale at the cosmos, we would see beings engaged not only in geoengineering, but in in engineering and reprogramming the structure of the cosmos itself. And that's not technology acting on nature. That's part of the nature of things, right? So yeah, I, I would say that technology is intrinsic to what evolution itself is on a cosmic scale when we consider the phenomenon of consciousness as inextricable from evolution and even from the manifestation of the cosmos. On a on a quantum level, mm -hmm. Moon being one of the examples. <laughs> Going back to your book, Artemis Unveiled, it is basically about the Moon, in a large, large way that it all starts and ends with the Moon. So Moon itself is a tool, right? Yeah, I mean, I made this argument at length in in uh, Closer Encounters. So if people want to look at it as an empirical case. Right, look at, at that chapter in Closer Encounters, where I give all of the you know complex mathematical data that's relevant to this. But long story short, I mean, and this was noticed by the way by two Soviet scientists in the in the 60s. They were the first ones, and they actually published in scientific journals on this. Um, um, Sherbakov, Vassin, and Sherbakov, and they pointed to various. Uh, types of evidence indicative of the moon being an hollow, largely hollow artificial satellite. And there are things like, you know, the fact that the, the crater basins are very shallow, regardless of how wide they are, they only go to a certain depth. And the wider the crater basin, the more obvious it becomes that the crater basins are all convex rather than concave, as if they're, you know, the, the ejecta, the moon dust, the regolith being blown aside by some asteroid impact or meteorite is revealing the inside of a hard curved surface, a shell that's underneath the regolith, as if the regolith is astroturf. And the fact that, you know, the two of the Apollo missions, uh, 
carried out impact tests with a pre-positioned seismometer that revealed that the, the moon uh, gives us back a resonance signature like that of a ringing bell that it, it, apparently there's a huge cavity inside the moon. In fact, the, the hard surface of the moon doesn't go down for more than a few you know tens of miles. And so there's all this evidence that you know it's it's largely hollow. And then there's the whole connection between UFOs and the moon. I mean, UFOs have been seen on the moon for 300 years. Going back to like French astronomers in the 1700s, they were watching these lights dancing around on the moon. And sometimes these lights would follow a straight line for like a very long period of time and then go out into space. Uh, there have been something like almost 500 of these observations going back several centuries. Uh, and you have remote viewers who worked um, for the CIA beginning in the 1970s, going through the 80s, who have repeatedly remote viewed uh, basically UFO pilots on the moon, including on a, a large structure, you might say a city located on the dark side of the moon. So, so yeah, I postulate in Artemis Unveiled that the moon is a kind of uh, uh, control center, uh, the Wizard of Oz booth controlling what goes on here on the earth and that uh, part of our struggle for liberation from these tyrannical forces that want to continue to lord over us, these devas, to put it in Iranian language, the devs, right? Um, or the Olympian gods that Prometheus revolted against. Part of our liberation struggle has to be to take the moon. We need to, to get inside the Wizard of Oz control booth there, you know, uh, and not only look behind the curtain, but take control of um, the wizard's machinery. I'm not saying to go blow up, you know, the the uh, the, the control booth, because if you want to understand how it works before you go, you know, um, disassembling it or anything like that. But um, the novel does begin with this striking image of essentially the moon being revealed for what it really is. So this um, race and evolution of um space war, basically a space race between China and the United States to go to the moon is going to be very telling, right, about within this context. Yeah, look, I, you know, I don't actually don't think the United States wants to go back up to the moon. I think what happened in Apollo was that, you know, the Americans ran into these people on the moon and they were told basically get the fuck out of here and don't ever come back. And that's why we haven't been back to the moon since. And, and matter of fact, we, the American military industrial complex never wanted to go to the moon in that kind of a public way. They wanted a military program and JFK is the one that really threw the monkey wrench in that. And I think it has something to do with, you know, the, the uh, tragic end that he met with. Uh, so, so it's not the Americans that are spear, that, that are basically the engine for this race to get back to the moon. And by the way, you know, the American program is called Artemis, Project Artemis. Artemis, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's the Chinese. I think that the Chinese have worked out some deal with the people on and in the moon. And that, I mean, this plays significantly into the narrative of my novella, that the Chinese have been chosen as a kind of managerial elite, like the Raj in British India. And that because of the extremely paternalistic, collectivist and traditionalist uh, characteristics of the Confucian mentality, the Chinese have been selected as the optimal culture to be able to help these overlords manage the planet after these convergent catastrophes have uh, reduced us to some form of, you know, um, quasi medieval feudalism, right? And so they don't want to, I mean, like again, like the British in India, they don't want to lord over us directly and, uh, you know, come up against the, the, uh, the inevitable backlash that will result from that. They want the Chinese to be there to sort of do the dirty work for them um, as the kind of layer in between them and the general population of Earth. And I find this, this Chinese and, and Russian... Uh, you know, joint project of lunar um, exploration, let's say. I don't think it's going to result in colonization for obvious reasons, if you consider what I've been saying. 
But this joint exploration by the Chinese and Russians is is really disturbing to me because, you know, the Russians have a full dossier on what happened to the American astronauts during Apollo, and undoubtedly they've had, handed that over to the Chinese. And the Chinese are not, you know, people who who um, given their Confucian mentality, are ready to be, uh, you know, caught unaware and and humiliated and shamefully, uh, you know, have to retreat back to the earth the way the Americans did. If they're going to the moon, they're going there with proper authorization, knowing that they're going to be successful in the venture that they've initiated. And that would require prior approval. So there, I think there is a, a an agreement that's been made, and America just has to go up there because like, you can't let the Chinese and the Russians go to the moon without making some half-hearted attempt to be back up there again as well. Yeah, but I don't know why we need NASA. It actually was a very good experience. I went up, I drove up three hours to see Artemis's lunch twice, wow. and they canceled twice. And you know, I've seen I think five or six space launches. They were all SpaceX. So it was like, why do we even need the government program and SpaceX is taking care of it? So I thought it was a very uh, great manifestation of this national versus post-national kind of an approach that, you know, bureaucrats, uh, a, a kind of a slow, expensive, wasteful, outdated approach by NASA ba built on bureaucracy and the kind of a adventurous, very Promethean approach by SpaceX. So I see the hope not in the government, but in, in the... Promethean pirates, you know, in whatever form that they come. Well, in Artemis Unveiled, another thing that I describe is um, sea-based uh, space launches uh, very much in the style of SpaceX that ultimately, you know, uh, Prometheism working in tandem with, you know, let's say even like non-governmental corporate elements in Iran uses these sea steads in places like, you know, Strait of Hormoz and the Caspian to be space launch uh, facilities. I mean, there's a there is a sea launch capability. I think it was called uh, Sea Dragon or something like that early in the um, 2000s, and um, it was a international consortium that was launching rockets from uh, a sea-based platform. Where the advantage is that the sea-based pla sea platform can go to the optimal launch point for the optimal trajectory, whereas you can't have that from a land-based uh, launch facility because the Earth is 70% oceans. So uh, it has certain advantages, and there was an international consortium that was doing that, so the technology is proven. That consortium ultimately failed because both Ukraine and Russia were members of it, and because of what happened between Ukraine and Russia beginning in 2014, the whole thing came apart. But point being, the technology is proven. And I depict this in, in uh, Artemis Unveiled, that this is another thing that we do. And um, in particular, I show how like the Iranians and the Israelis, you know, are like working together to basically field this uh, rogue piratical space program that ultimately succeeds in, they shoot past Mars because Mars is controlled by the same entities that are on the moon. And so they shoot past Mars and go and colonize the asteroid belt and start mining the asteroids and building facilities inside them. And that's where, you know, you have this, like, ultimately, uh, this piratical community built throughout the asteroid belt. And that the asteroid belt and the lawless oceans of the Earth become the two main bastions of resistance against, um, you know, the global tyranny of these uh, devas. Uh, you mentioned, and I, when I read it, um, that you, you use the Wizard of Oz as some kind of a hint about how the moon works. Immediately reminded me of an episode of Rick and Morty called Close Recounters of Rick Kind, especially when you're talking about how Mars is a target rather than moon, because in moon, um, the psychic noise of the hundreds of millions of humans that they govern back on Earth would be like disrupting. So in this episode, Close Recounters of Rick Kind, the Mortys were, imp I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the dynamic sure. in the case. Yeah, I know, the, sure. Mor the Mortys were imprisoned in a dimension of evil Rick's design with many of them hooked up to torture apparatuses so the Morty waves caused by the pain would hide from the citadel of Rick's. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, horrific, but probably <laughs> maybe not that far away from some of the things that actually are done you know, to humanity uh, by overlords with singularity level technology, which they don't want us to have. I mean, that's the fire, see? Yeah. 
The fire that Prometheus steals from Olympus ultimately is singularity level technology. That's that's what it's a metaphor for. It's the tech. It's the technology that these Olympian self-styled gods have that these devas have, and that you know Zarathustra and Prometheus want us to also have, so that we can determine our own destiny. So maybe to sum it up, what has been the significance of the moon throughout? Iranian history and Iranian culture? That's a good question. Um, you know, one of the most interesting references to the moon is actually in this story called uh, Gonbad -e Kabud. Gonbad -e Kabud, the black dome, blue black. Which blue let me just say this, that this is in the beginning of pretty much every story in Iran. Right? Interesting. Yep. And I mean, this is a long story, but OK, in, in uh, Nezami's Haft Peykar, in The Seven Beauties by um, Nezami Ganjavi, Persian poet from, I think, the 1400s, um, he wrote in this book, there's like seven domes, okay? And there's a princess uh, under each dome. And the Sassanid Shah, Bahram, uh, has stories told to him by these princesses of the various domes. And the princess of the black dome tells him this story about why all the people in a certain village were black. And it's the story about like this guy who goes to this village and he sees all the people there wear black all the time. And he finds out they do that because they're in mourning because from this village, there's a way to go up into the stars. There's this thing that comes and it takes people up into the stars. And Nezami describes it as like a column fallen on its side and people can go into it and it takes them up to the moon. This is interesting. I think this is another one of these, like Jacques Vallée, you know, did a whole study in Passport to Magonia of folk tales and, you know, folklore from various cultures that preserve uh, close encounters that took place in past centuries. And I think this is one Persian example, is that this is a cylindrical UFO that's being described. And so there, there's, there's this village, and this UFO frequents this village, and it takes these people up, and... So this guy, the protagonist of this tale, he goes for a ride himself and he's taken up to the moon and he meets this fairy queen who has this retinue of basically like fairies um, working for her patties. These patties are working for her and she's the, you know, the queen of the patties. And the, protag and the, the queen keeps telling the protagonist uh, that we, like you belong, we belong together and I'm yours, but like you have to be patient and, uh, you know, our union is something that cannot be rushed and entertain yourself with my patties with this retinue of fairies until like it's the right time for us to be one. Anyway, long story short, the guy becomes too impatient and aggressive, and he essentially tries to take advantage of this fairy queen, and he's suddenly put back into the cylinder and dropped back down to earth. And apparently this has happened to every single one of these people in this village, and this is why they all wear black. And by the way, interesting, the men in black. They all wear black, the men in black. So that's another trope that's in here. And by the way, I had my own men in black experience in Iran, which I'll tell you about before we end this uh, conversation, because it's somehow related to Artemis Unveiled as well. But um, so this is why all these people wear black. But here's the thing about Nezami is going back to your question. This is not really a tangent. Going back to your question, Nezami's account that's interesting in Gomba de Kabut is that the, the fairy queen, and by the way, I discussed this in novel, my book, Novel Folklore. The fairy queen seems to be trying to tell this protagonist that you are trying to take what you already have and are. And I am not separate from you. I, the beloved who you're seeking, am already one with you. And so your attempt to aggressively seize what it is that you already are 
is going to be the cause for tragedy and misfortune and, and, and misery. And you will mourn the loss of what you tried to take but already have, not realizing, not realizing it, that you already have. And this is the queen of the moon. So there's something being said in this story. And I, I kind of speculated about this in the, you know, um, the exegesis I offered in, in novel folklore that I want to be careful how I say this, uh, okay, but um, it, it could be that we need to think in different terms about our relation to who and what it is that controls the moon. And that victory, because, okay, love is also considered a conquest. Like the guy is up there to, to have a conquest of this princess, right? It's a conquest of the moon in essence. And so we need to think differently about what this conquest means, what it would mean, right? To, to, um, to uh, basically have this uh, princess, right? Um, and and, and there is a, there's an interesting relationship between love and war here on a metaphysical level that has to be uh, contemplated. That, you know, there are certain uh, conquests that require seduction and not just force. And, you know, so it's possible, again, I'm not going to say too much more about this for certain, there's reasons why I don't want to say too much more about this, but there are, there are battles you can win through seduction that you can't win through force. And there's, there's kinds of, let's say, conception and incubation and gestation that can take place through seduction that cannot result from mere aggression and seizure. And that has something to do with our relationship to the moon, which I think Nezami preserved in Have to Pay Cat. The seduction that you're saying, I think Cleopatra and Julius Caesar's relationship is one of the best examples of like what Cleopatra did you know, many, many armies basically couldn't do. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, right. we can't really pussyfoot around that. Yeah. And and so and so remember, listen, if I mean, if there are people on the moon, these self-styled gods, these devas, whatever, they're people. In the end, they're people. And, you know, that's something to remember is that people um, can also be seduced. Before your uh, Man in Black in Iran experience, you know, my latest album is called uh, Man Tool Reason, which is also the name of the last chapter of the book that I released, uh, Three Books of the Experience. I call it Man Tool Reason because it's a man, human, and there's a tool technology, but then there must be some kind of an intention behind using that tool, which is a reason. And this is the job of a shaman to determine that. And my problem with all these shamans currently who do like ayahuasca circles and stuff, which uh, is that technology and nature, again, for them are two completely separate things. And you use a very interesting term, techno shamanism. So I want you to talk a little about that, because I think it's very important. We need techno shamans, that spirituality that is absence of technology is an outdated kind of an, a spirituality. And there is no use to any of us right now. We need a intention and a spirituality, however you want to define it, that is empowered by the use of technology that is just as natural to our nature as the rest of the nature. My response to that can be very succinct. succinct. I mean, I, I have, you know, the, my concept of the spectral revolution addresses this question throughout many of my works, uh, beginning with Prometheus and Atlas, but, but I can put it very succinctly, which is that all these, uh, um, basically um, plants that the shamans deal with and all the potions that they create and psychedelic compounds like ayahuasca and so on and so forth. You think that's not technology? Absolutely. Of course it's technology. Absolutely. Technology comes from the Greek word techne. Techne means craft. And by the way, poesis is also a form of techne. Techne and the Greeks understood this, poesis meaning poetic composition as a form of craft. So craft includes the various arts as well. And it, so technology has an aesthetic dimension to it inextricably. So all, which like includes the shaman dances, the aesthetic dimension of shamanism, the masks and totems and dances, it's all technology. 
And so, so look, these people, I mean, they've got some kind of Gnostic dualist uh, presuppositions that they are committed to, which are entirely false. Yep. We're just dealing with different types of technology. That's what it is. And a lot of this has to do with how um, people like Rene Descartes working for the Jesuit order in Europe at, at you know in the early enlightenment at end of the renaissance early enlightenment deliberately created a mechanistic reductionistic materialism to be the the ontological basis of modern science this was done i argued this in prometheus and atlas you want to look at the case for it look at that chapter reason and terror in prometheus and atlas this was done deliberately the church particularly the jesuit order had an agenda to create a mechanistic reductionistic uh, paradigm for modern science so that people would stop dabbling in the kind of sorcery that Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake for, you know, for performing, right? I mean, they were afraid of these alchemists like Paracelsus and Cornelius Agrippa and so on and so forth. They were afraid of science continuing to proceed without any distinction between spirit and matter, without this false dichotomy between the, the psychical or spiritual and the material or the natural. This false dichotomy was created by the church who set up a false mechanistic reductionist uh, materialist paradigm so that they could continue to monopolize on all spiritual phenomena so that everything spiritual would remain in the domain of the church. And if it hadn't been for this bullshit, you know, <laughs> we would ha have, science would be shamanism. Giordano yep. Bruno was a shaman. He yep. was a scientist, but he was a shaman. And so it's just more sophisticated form of shamanism. And I mean, that's the case that I make in Prometheus and Atlas. So, so yeah, I, I entirely agree with you. In this creation of false narrative, I can't help it by share it, that one of these shamans, a little modernized, I guess, uh, we had the conversation about the same thing. And he told me that, Aga, you don't understand. There was this incident in Zimbabwe that a whole bunch of school kids came across aliens and then telepathically they convey this message that you are destroying the planet. It is because of use of technology. And I'm like, don't you think if your enemy would see that your only chance of survival is technology, wouldn't like telepathically tell you that this is the wrong thing you're doing? This is against your interest? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, please, uh, please share your <laughs> men in black uh, experience in Iran. So, I just want to say one thing about that, the Zimbabwe. <laughs> I mean, it's Stockholm Syndrome, okay? Listen, what's being done to us is our oppressor, our, our uh, hostage taker. Who are humans. Who are humans, are trying to find ways to condition us into loving them and loving our captivity. That's what it is. And we're going to be made to feel this is what, the, you know, in these situations like hostage situations and Stockholm syndrome and domestic abuse situations that are similar to that. This is what is done, uh, you know, through psychological manipulation is that a person is made to feel guilty and then punished for something that, that wasn't wrong in the first place. Right, and, and that's what they're going to do to us in terms of our will to develop science and technology. They're going to engineer all these calamities and then blame us for destroying the earth and like de mass dehumanization and so on and so forth. It's it's all a con game. Anyway, men in black. So, so I dedicated this book to my fiance Nassim and to Mohammad Mossadegh. And there's a connection between those two. This is not a haphazard, like how, how, why is Mossadegh all of a sudden in the middle of a dedication to my fiance or vice versa, right? What, what's the story here? There's a story here. The story is that, <clears throat> what was it, 2004? I was in uh, Iran during my travels in Iran, uh, June, and I was in Shiraz and I think it's very significant. I had spent the day hiking up to the cave of Shapur, which is in the middle of nowhere. You have to go way outside of Shiraz, somewhere in the mountains in the Fars province. There is a cave way up at the top of the mountain um, where a stalactite has been carved into a statue of the Sassanid emperor uh, Shapur, Shapur the first, the great Shapur, who I truly consider great. I think that guy was like, among a handful of the most visionary political geniuses 
who ever ruled any country. Um, anyway, be that as it may, Shahpur the Great. And so I made a pilgrimage up to this, this cave. Um, nobody was there, nobody. And uh, I went, my driver came up with me and uh, on our way down from the cave, it was around sunset and we heard the mountain lions. And we were like, shit, we better pick up the pace here, you know. Anyway, we get back to the hotel. I was staying at Hotel Homa in Shiraz. We get back after midnight. Everything is shut down. And I mean, there's nowhere I could even get anything to eat or whatever. So I'm kind of like starved, thirsty. And all I had in the refrigerator, I had bought some Shiraz grapes. You know, the Shiraz grapes that they make the Shiraz wine from, which on, sadly is not made in Iran anymore, but Shiraz wine grapes. And I had frozen these in the in the refrigerator, and that's all I had to eat and drink were these Shiraz grapes after basically hiking all day in Qara Shapur. So I'm telling you these details for a reason, okay? So number one, I went on a pilgrimage somewhere in the middle of fucking nowhere, okay? Second of all, I was kind of starved and thirsty, right? Which is like conditions emulating fasting, basically. And I wake up suddenly, I fall asleep on my bed with these grapes next to me, right? Not having shut the lights off or anything in my clothes. I just fall asleep. I collapse on the bed and in the middle of the night. And next thing I wake up and there's light on in the room. Uh, but the room is full of these men in black suits, black suit, black tie, black hat. And most of them had taken their hats off and they were holding their fedora hats in their arms, like against their chest. And it was so startling because the room, it was exactly like the same room, okay? So I didn't think I was dreaming because the room was exactly the same. And I was in the exact position I was when I fell asleep in the same clothes and so forth. So my first impulse was like, before I could even process these people, I reached for the phone to pick it up to call security and be like, who the fuck let these people into my room, right? It was that real. And, but then I see that they're congregating around the bathroom and my curiosity got the best of me. I want to know, like, what are these people looking at? Clearly, they're engaging with something that's in the bathroom. So I put the phone down and I get up and I they don't look immediately threatening. I mean, they're not they're just standing around the bathroom, barely even you know, acknowledging me. And I make my way through them. And there in the bathtub is Mohammed Mossadegh. And he's got a few of these men in black around him and he sees me. And he kind of he reaches his you know old bony finger out, and he goes like this to the men who are b blocking the view between me and him. He pushes them to the side, at which point they turn around and they look at me, and they looked at me with like contempt and resentment, uh, almost as if like they were they were like trying to get gain favor with this guy, like they were a bunch of ass kissers or something, and. The, or they were trying to control him, both flatter and control him, something like that. And they were very displeased, let's say, that, that he was acknowledging me and basically telling them to get the fuck aside. And he starts pointing at me. Mossadegh looks at me and he starts pointing at me directly like this. And Mossadegh was dead for people who don't know for like 70 years, 60 years? He died in late 60s, right? Right. So he was dead for... 40 something years. 40 something years. Yeah. Wow. Then they, they grab Mossadegh, these men in black, two of them, grab him, they help him up out of the bathtub, they put a towel around him, and they walk him. It was a hotel room with these two beds. You know, it was one of those hotel rooms that has the two separated beds. And they put him on one of the beds in a towel. And then they disappear. All the men in black, all of a sudden, they disappear. The bed that you were sleeping in, or no, the other bed? One opposite it. Okay. So, so they put... They put him on the one opposite it, and I sit on the bed that I had been sleeping on. And all the men in black disappear. But Mossadegh's still there. Mossadegh's still there in the bathroom. <laughs> Here's where it gets really weird. Mossadegh proceeds to turn into a woman. And I had a, a vivid, you know, a recollection. I have a vivid recollection of what this woman looked like. And... It was an older woman, but she wasn't as old as Mossadegh. Like I would say at that time, I was in my 20s. And that woman was maybe in her late 50s or early 60s or something like that. And she had, you know, her hair was going gray. It was, she had salt and pepper hair. 
like your beard. And um, the towel kind of dropped and I walk over to her and she looked in my eyes. I'll never forget the look that from this woman. It's like she knew me much better than I knew myself. And anyway, I'm not going to go into further detail about that. But in any case, I, I put my hand on the chest of this woman. And at the moment when I did that, it was like we became one being. It was, you know, most complete fusion of consciousness and existence with this person. And uh, then I woke up in my bed with the grapes next to me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this happened, right? Okay, now. Wow. Now, why is the the book dedicated to my fiance? Hold on one second. Was that did look like the time that he was in? Um, he was exiled. End of his life. End of his life. It was the old Mossadegh, really old. He was really old. Like he was not like a zombie or anything. He was Mossadegh, but oh, very no, old. No, no. Oh, no. Right. He was very sharp, in fact. The way he pointed at me, like he was there mentally. Wow. And, um, and how long would you say this uh, this uh, vision, this experience lasted? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, dreams, like they have a different, they have a different, yes. um, uh, Look, the, what, the, what the scale what the, is different. But what it felt like in lived yeah. experience was something like the whole process was maybe like 10 minutes, mm. 10, 10 minutes or so. And uh, anyway, so I fast forward to 2000 and 2017. I'm in Los Angeles uh, as the keynote speaker of an event where I was supposed to introduce this coalition. This, uh, this is bizarre shit, Aga, I'm telling you something. <laughs> I spent that day sitting next to the, lead, the leader of Jepe Melli. So we had formed a coalition of all the nationalist parties for the first time transcending the, uh, the division between monarchists and people who want a republic, which was a huge achievement. I mean, this was Absolutely. like- Absolutely. Okay, and so I was the person chosen to introduce this coalition in the English language for consumption of the international media. And that speech exists. You can look it up. It's in, it's in YouTube. Uh, it's in my playlist on Iranian civilization and YouTube. That speech is still up there. And so I gave this speech and through the whole speech, I'm sitting next to the leader of Jepem Ali. And then the evening of that event, I'm in Westwood, Terangelis, and um, and I'm I'm sitting at this cafe uh, across from Cholet, the restaurant Cholet, and uh, I'm sitting at this cafe with the people from the Running Renaissance organization who were at the event that day, and I hear someone call out my name from behind me, and I turn around, and it's this uh, young woman, Nasim Nouri, who I had known vaguely through Facebook. Um, and so I got up and uh, greeted her. I greeted her. We stood there on the sidewalk. We talked for a few minutes. And interestingly, one of the members of the Iranian Renaissance who watched us, he told me after like, oh, how you hugged and kissed her and whatever. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. We just stood there and talked. So he saw somehow an aura or essence of that encounter, right? Now, what Nassim didn't know when I, and which I wasn't going to tell her and didn't tell her for some time after, was that I had uh, basically amassed a whole folder of photographs of her from Facebook. I didn't want to tell her this and like, oh, what kind of stalker are you, right? <laughs> I had been, we had been Facebook friends and I right. had a few exchanges. And I had a whole photo, folder of her photographs because when I, she first, I think she reached out to me after having seen one of my interviews on Facebook. And when I saw her photos, I was like, fuck, this is that woman. Whoa. Except, except 30 years younger. Right. Like that. It was the young, I could see immediately. And so 20 years or something. Hey, and you got, uh, you got uh, like glitchy from saw her immediately. So I, so I, when I saw pictures of her on Facebook, I recognized that the woman who, in, who Mossadegh turned into in the Shiraz hotel room was yeah, an older. It's her, person. but younger. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, I mean, the rest is history. You know, we stuck, up, we struck up a, a relationship from there. Um, 
And, you know, the rest is history. And so this wow. is why the book is dedicated to both Nassim and to Mohammed Mossadegh. <laughs> that was incredible. I appreciate you sharing it because I, you know, I know it's it's not a... I think I've ever gone into this in this kind of depth or detail anywhere or discussed it in an interview. So this is this will be the first time. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, your trust and feel of uh, comfort. It was the right place and the right time, Olga. <laughs> And the right and the right interviewer. Thank you so much. Hey, I, the, maybe as a last question, this motto uh, of liberty or death, this has been very near and dear to me. And you know, at some point in my life, it kind of became an ideology that it is what it is, and it kind of led the rest of my life. And you're saying that this has a Iranian root and it basically is an Iranian motto. So maybe uh, we can end with this. Liberty, Liberty or death. death. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's an Iranian motto in the sense that uh, when you look at the Pahlavani culture, the culture of chivalry, mm -hmm. going all the way back to at least the Parthians um, and the culture which, you know, Rostam and other heroes of the Shahnameh embody, you see very much an ethos that prefers martyrdom to living under any kind of oppression. You know, um, the in, in the Parthian culture, it was uh, it was it was not viewed well for you to to be an old man, to be an old person. Um, if you were an old person in like early Parthian culture, you were some battle scarred behemoth who just like could not manage to get himself killed. And, you know, they have this in the Shah Nameh, uh, how, you know, uh, this imagery of how tulips, the red tulips grow from where the blood of the Pahlavans has been spilled. And so there's this, you know, ethos that goes way back in Iran of uh, fighting to the death for freedom and pre preferring the, the life of azadegi, of free spiritedness, to living under any bidot, you know, living under any injustice. And uh, it's, it's consistent throughout the course of Iranian history. You see it, you know, very prominently in the order of assassins and, you know, the, the, the uh, Hassan Saba and his associates at Alamut. And it carries on up to today that a lot of people are willing to die for freedom. Hopefully their blood wouldn't be wasted by some other totalitarians and some other tyrants. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I've got nothing more to say. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. Likewise. And um, I look forward to many future conversations with you, Ago. Yes, same here. Thank and, you so and, much. And some of them hopefully taking place in Iran. Yeah. Man, yeah. how amazing would that be? Yes. It will happen. It'll happen. I believe. I hope so. I hope so. Well, liberty or death. Liberty or death. Thank you, my friend. Thank you.